Lecture 21 Beowulf Historical Roots and Heroic Values Hear it. You be told the tales of the long gone glories of the, and the dauntless deeds of the dreaded Danish kings. These words from the Beowulf introduce our next set of lectures on the heroes, the myths, the history of the Germanic Age, the hero heroic age of the Teutons, paralleling in many ways the heroic age of the Greeks. It is an epoch that has special meaning to us who speak the English language, for our language is derived from the Germans, and the first magnificent major work of literature in what would become the English language is the Epic of Beowulf, one of the most important, one of the most profound, one of the most provocative of all the Germanic epics. Who are the Germans? They are well known to the Greeks, and by the time of the Romans they had become one of the major threats to the safety of Italy. At the end of the 2nd century BC, around 106 BC, Germanic tribes, the Teutones and the Cimbri, destroyed a Roman army and led to a major transformation in the uh, very nature of the Roman state in which a citizen militia was replaced by a professional army and also gave us the enduring name of Teutons as a synonym for Germans. Caesar was well aware of the danger that the Germans presented to Rome during his campaigns in Gaul in 55 and in 54 and also in 58 BC. He led major attacks upon the Germans crossing the Rhine. And the land of the Germans was amorphous. It stretched from at least the Danube River and areas that we would call Bohemia today in the Czech Republic to the Rhine even across the Rhine to what we would call Holland today, the land of the tribe of the Batavii, and then eastward all the way out to the steppes of what we call Russia today. All of this was inhabited by Germanic-speaking tribes, fiercely independent, some of them still leaving names that we recognize today, like Sweden, the land of the tribe of the Swedes, or Denmark, the uh, land of the tribe of the Danes, and Swabia, one of the areas of Germany today still preserving the name of the tribe of the Swabii. So the Germans were long known to history, but during the heyday of the empire, while the Romans were not able to conquer Germany, they at least held the Germans at bay. But in the third century AD, Germanic raiders began to ravage parts of the Roman Empire, crossing into Gaul, but also crossing the channel to attack Roman Britain. And by the early fourth century, the danger, particularly from the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, Saxons living in the northern part of Germany today, Angles living into what is Denmark today, and the Jutes living in the peninsula that still bears the name Jutland, the land of the Jutes, along with Frisians from the islands off the coast of Germany and Holland. All of these were attacking Roman Britain to such a degree that a whole set of forts were built called the Saxon shore forts. But in 410 AD, the Romans were no longer able to defend Britain. And the Roman Emperor Honorius wrote to the Britons and said, you are now on your own. And the Roman garrisons were withdrawn. And all through the fifth century, the Roman Britons fought gallantly to withstand this tide of Germanic invaders. And the invaders were coming not just to raid, but to settle. Until finally by about the middle of the seventh century, Roman Britain was no more, Britannia was no more, and we lived in England, the land of the Angles. 
and the few Roman Britons were driven far to the west where they would have names, the name of the Welch, which is simply the Anglo-Saxon word for foreigners. And the Anglo-Saxons, with their fierce warlike ways and independence, following the war chief that they chose, not necessarily a hereditary war chief, established kingdoms in Anglo-Saxon England. The kingdom of Mercia, the kingdom of Northumbria, the kingdom of the West, Saxon, West Saxons, or what we would call Wessex, the kingdom of the South Saxons, or Sussex, and at the court, probably of the king of Mercia, sometime around 730 or 740 AD, a singer of tales, like a Homer, sung one of the most beautiful of these Germanic war epics that we know already in the second century AD were sung by their bards, their singers of tales, delineating the deeds of Beowulf. Now, as the poet tells us, he is not talking about his own day. He is taking us back to the long-gone glories of the Danish kings. And his poem is a story of the time when, the Den when Denmark was ruled by King Hrothgar. And to his aid came the peerless hero Beowulf. This poem begins like the Iliad, in a way, with death. After having been told that we are going to hear the tales of the peerless deeds of the Danish kings, we are then told in the next line that we will hear now of skilled Skeffing, one of the greatest of all the Danish kings. Now, Beowulf is composed in Anglo-Saxon. It is a poem. It is composed orally and then was taken down in writing. And the Anglo-Saxon language is very closely related to our English of today. About 55% of the words you speak are from Anglo-Saxon. Uh, and the verse is highly alliter alliterative, as I told you in our first uh, beginnings of our lecture. We be told the tales of the dauntless deeds of the dreaded Danish kings and their long gone glory. So they love this G and G and P and P and D and D. And the poem was so carefully crafted that a singer of tales among the Anglo-Saxon was known as a wordsmith. And at first, when the Beowulf was rediscovered, for it had lain hidden in a private library for many centuries, when it was rediscovered, it was thought to be very digressive, not particularly interesting, as, as the first edition of the uh, Oxford Collection of English Verse said, the Beowulf is pretty small beer. But critics like Tolkien, the author of the Lord of the Rings, J.R. Tolkien, began to see the unity of this poem and the care with which the wordsmith, as much as Homer, had created an entire world and conveyed the highest moral truths. So we would begin with death. Skilled Skeffing was one of the greatest of the Danish kings. He came to us as a castaway. Nobody knew from whence he came, but he proved himself to be a mighty war chief. He gathered unto himself faithful warriors, and he made, and he made the name of the, of the Danes dreaded throughout the land of the Germans. Many brought him tributes and gifts, and he gave out these gifts with justice, and fairness to his retainers. He made many wars, he won many conquests, he brought back much plunder, and he ruled justly. He was a good king. And that's the definition of a good king in the world of the Beowulf. And his throne descended down until his great-grandson Hrothgar ruled in the halls of Heriot, that he had built. Aren't these wonderful names? Rothgar, Heriot, these magnificent, resounding names. 
And Rothgar in his day was a powerful warrior. And he too made the name of the Danes dreaded all around. But he grew old. And in his wealth and older age, he built this hall, Helrot. Now, Helrot has been located. This is not some mythical place. It has been located right where it should be located in Denmark, in Zealand. And it is a very large hall suitable for a king. And it dates to right around 560, BC, uh, 560 AD, which is when the Beowulf would let us date some of these events sometime between 520 and 560. So he built his hall, Helrot, and there much feast was made, and for many years his warriors were merry and brought back much plunder from faraway places. But nothing is ever happy for long. Sooner or later, grim fate strikes us. And every night, as the Mead cups were raised high in the hall of Rothgar. An evil monster wandered the earth. God had sent this monster. He was the offspring of Cain. And all monsters and all evil things are the offspring of Cain. Now, the poet of the Beowulf is Christian, but he is at an uneasy alliance between his Christian faith and the still deep, deep dyed in his veins Germanic tradition of bloodlust and war and instead of forgiveness, of vengeance. But God had sent this evil monster perhaps to remind Rothgar and all of us that all human deeds are fleeting and, e and ephemeral. So one night, while the warriors slept in the hall, for a Germanic king, a Danish king like Rothgar, has his retainers, he takes care of them, gives them their armor, gives them their rewards when they are victorious in battle, and they serve him. They stay in his mead hall, his drinking hall, and of course their greatest dream is to die in battle and be carried up into the Nordic heaven Val by the Valkyries, these women who come down and bear them up, and there they will spend the rest of their days, all eternity, drinking and gambling and fighting. So they fall asleep there on the benches, guarding their king. This night, the door is burst open, and in comes the monster Grendel. And he grabs one and pops his head off just the way you would pop the lid off of a, a can of soda. And drinks down the blood and then munches up the body and then crunches the bones the way you would a chicken bone. And then goes after another and another and another until when the morning comes, the whole of the hall of Herorot is filled with blood and dead bodies. And night after night, the monster returns. And no matter how brave they are, no matter how much ale they drink to give them extra courage, no matter how strong their chain mail armor and their boar's head helmets and their bejeweled swords are, no, of the, none of the Danes can stand up against the savage onslaught of Grendel. Thus the years pass and fewer and fewer retainers can be found for Rothgar and his hall is almost desolate. But across the sea, in the land of the Geats, Part of what we would call Sweden today, there is still an area of Sweden called Geatland, the land of the Geats. The story of the terrible losses at Herorot are heard. And one warrior, Beowulf, decides he will cross the whale way. That is one of the keenings, that is one of the circumlocutions by which our poet describes the ocean. He will cross the whale way. His father has been a friend of Rothgar, and in fact, when his father had to flee because of murder and blood vengeance, he had been taken in by Rothgar, and Rothgar had put an end to the blood feud by giving gold and other ornaments of great value to the offended tribe. So Rothgar helped my father, now I will go help him. And 
Just like Jason, Beowulf sends out a advertisement throughout the land of the Geats, and 14 stalwart warriors volunteer to sail with him to the land of the Danes and to rid the hall of Hrothgar of Grendel. They go on a quest, in other words, in pursuit of a monster and of the glory that this will bring. They arrive in Denmark, and the Coast Guard checks them out. And a Coast Guardsman rides up and says, Who be you, friends or foe? We be friends. Well, I can tell one thing by your armor and the way you bear yourself. You are mighty in battle. Why have you come? We have heard this tale of the sorrow that sits upon this land, and we have come to see if we cannot rid you of this danger. Now, uh, many brave men have tried, and many brave men have been eaten by Grendel. But I will take you to Herorot and introduce you to Hrothgar, our king. They are led then to Herorot, and come into the forecourt, and they are met by the spokesperson, the orator, as he is called, of Hrothgar. And these are real people out of the Germanic age. Every king had his orator as well as he had his singer of tales. Who be you? Beowulf is my name. I come from the land of the Geats. We have come to kill the monster Grendel. I will go in and ask the king if he will see you. I will see them, of course, says Hrothgar. I knew this Beowulf when he was just a little boy. I gave shelter to his father. Beowulf, you know that name means bee hunter. Uh, it's uh, another keening, another circumlocution. Uh, of course, Rothgar didn't say this. Another circumlocution for a bear. And that little fellow, Beowulf, had a grip like a bear when he was like two years old. He would just about tear your arm off. I want to see him and see what kind of warrior he's grown into be, because I have heard that he has done many valiant deeds. So in comes Beowulf. Beowulf is my name. Yes, I know you well. Let us shake hands. Oh, that's a powerful hand. Aye, you don't remember me, but I knew you when you were a baby. I know that you took good care of my father, and I hope I can help you. I hope so too. But first, let us feast. Great banquet is laid out. The retainers of Hrothgar are there. His wife is there. And most of the time, the wives of these Germanic chieftains are chaste and beautiful. And she, with great dignity, passes around the cups of ale. They feast upon beef, lamb. And then one of the orators of Hrothgar, Unfair, stands up. He's sort of drunk. And it doesn't sit well with some of the retainers of uh, Rothgar that these strangers have come to try to help them out of a situation that they should be able to handle themselves. Unfer begins to speak. I have heard of you, Beowulf. You're not much. I hear that you and Breca, the king of a northern tribe, tried to swim all the way across from Norway, far off to Britain and you got caught up in a storm, and Breca had to save your life. Unfer, if you weren't so drunk, I'd kill you right here on the spot. You don't know what you're talking about. No one dare challenge the honor of a great warrior. No, Breca was the one who gave out. I had to carry him, carry him in my left arm, my sword killing sea creatures, and when I finally reached shore, they were lying all around it, dead sea creatures that I had killed. Then I swam all the way around the Lapland and came back home. That night, they go to sleep. The retainers of Rothgar have quite cautiously taken their place far away from the hall. And even the king and his wife sleep far away. And Grendel comes and kicks open the door and grabs one of Beowulf's men and rips his head off and starts to eat him. And then Beowulf reaches up, and just as he has sworn he will not use any sword, and simply grabs Grendel by the arm 
and Grendel can feel his ah hand cracking under the blows of Beowulf, and they bang and crash each other off the walls. And finally, Beowulf gives one giant tug, and the arm of Grendel comes off, and the creature drags himself out, dying. And in the morning when Hrothgar and his wife return to the hall of Heriorot, there is the arm and claw of Grendel hung above the entranceway. The feasting that day is long and fine. Treasures are presented to Beowulf, which he then presents to his warriors. And that night they go to sleep and rest quietly. The retainers the king in his own quarters, and Beowulf and his men sleeping soundly. Ah, but Beowulf did not know what the country people said, what the king should have known, that Beowulf had killed Grendel, but Grendel, like all of us, had a mom. Now, and like all of our moms, she loved him. And she wasn't going to let her little boy be killed like this. So in the dark of night, when all things evil fly, she crashes into the hall and begins to kill and destroy, kill and destroy. And Beowulf has been given a separate sleeping chamber. And when the dawn has come and Beowulf comes back to the hall, the king with him, they see the signs of all the ravaging and destruction. And the mother has carried away Asher, the king's oldest and most trusted counselors. You see, just when everything looks good, that's when evil strikes. You cannot escape from the fate of death and evil. What has happened here, asked King Hrothgar. The country people tell us that two of them were seen out in the moors, Grendel, and now this must be his mother. Oh, Beowulf, you have not brought me anything but more sorrow. Asher was my most trusted counselor. We're not done yet. The hero does not give up in the midst of a seemingly endless fight. We will ride to the place where they say this monster dwells, and I will kill it all by myself. And so Rothgar, his retainers, including Unfair, and Beowulf himself and his 13 tried and tested warriors ride out. And they come to a volcanic-type lake with all sorts of monsters swimming in the boiling water. Sea demons, creatures like giant serpents. Perhaps we call them lake demons rather than sea demons, but these monstrous shapes. Beowulf takes an arrow and shoots one, watches it go to its end, and then stripping off his armor, says, I shall plunge down and do battle. Unfer says, why don't you take my sword with me, you? It has always been trusty in battle. I call it runting. Why, thank you, Unfer. And now we can forget all the harsh words we said to each other. We certainly can, Beowulf. So Beowulf leaps and swims down deep and deep into those waters and comes to the very bottom. It takes him almost the whole day. But there he comes into a large cave where he can stand upright and where he can breathe air. And the mother of Grendel comes after him. And the two of them do mighty battle. And Beowulf takes the sword, runting, that has been given to him by Unfair. And it does nothing. It has no blade to it whatsoever. No sharpness. And it is useless, and he throws it away. Then he sees a huge sword standing by the wall of this mighty cave, plunder taken from some long dead warrior, and Beowulf grabs it and goes after mom, and they slash and they cut 
and they slash, and he kills her. And the very sword with which he has been slashing her, when her blood pours over it, dissolves as though it were an icicle. So long has he been gone that Rothgar and his retainers have gone back to the hall. But Beowulf's faithful warriors are still sitting, watching when the hero emerges victorious. They go back again. This time the feasting is even grander. And Rothgar feels in his heart, feels rightly, that now the evil has passed. But even as the singer sings tales, he gives warnings. Warnings of a Danish king who grew so fond of his wealth that he began to be unjust and tyrannical. Or of another king of a far-off tribe who died and left his sons in the care of his brother when the brother had them killed and took the throne away. Treachery is always lurking in the world of Beowulf. With their deed done, their fame established, so much so that 1,500 years later we still tell of Beowulf, they return to the land, the Geats. And there they are welcomed by Beowulf's kinsman, his uncle Hijalak. The story is told, and with the true magnanimity of a hero, Beowulf gives his share of the treasure, the beautiful horses he has been given, the magnificent helmet he has been given by Hrothgar to his warlord and chief, Hijalak. And Hijalak rewards him with large tracts of land and builds a hall for Beowulf and entrusts his own sons to the keeping of Beowulf. And Beowulf will keep his trust, but when all have passed away, all the sons of Hrothgar, then Beowulf himself will become king over the Geats. And for 50 years he will lead them in battle, bringing back trophies and triumph. But even at the end of our lives, sorrow will fall upon us. That is the lesson of the Beowulf in this grim and fatalistic world. And the old man Beowulf must go out one more time. A dragon has struck his land. For many generations it has slept in a tomb or flown around at night sometimes, but stayed at this tomb that was filled with wealth from a long ago time. And a slave, trying to flee a beating from his master, has found this cave and stolen a cup. And the dragon, now enraged, flies all through the land of Beowulf, the land of the Geats, burning and destroying. And Beowulf goes out one more time, taking with him his kinsman Wiglaf, and the two of them go to battle against this dragon. So fierce is its breath that it burns their swords, and Beowulf is scorched badly. But is helped by his kinsman, he pulls out his dagger and kills the dragon. But he himself is mortally wounded. Give me a burial that is worthy of me, and take care of my people, the Geats. And a great tumulus is built. And a magnificent funeral pyre is raised up. And gold and silver and magnificent weapons are laid inside the tumulus. And as the body of Beowulf is consumed, the women march round and round singing a dirge. Now horrible times will fall upon us. We will see much misery. And... Fourteen warriors ride around singing the deeds of Beowulf and how he was the greatest of all the kings. Such magnificent burials, sometimes in ships, sometimes in tumuli and barrows, are found in the 6th century in the land of the Geats and the land of the Swedes. Hijalak was a real person who died in battle sometime around 521 
And as a Beowulf tells us, Beowulf swam back to the land of the Geats, bearing 30 suits of armor, and became one day king over the Geats. So a strong kernel of history surrounds this tale. But more than that, it is the values it conveys. The values of war, of honor, and above all, the idea of fate. Just as in the Iliad, we are all going to die. What matters if, is if a thousand years after our death, our fame endures, as did the fame of Beowulf.